It's uh, good to be with you again, and uh, we pray that the Lord will use this time um, and use our our weakness uh, to uh, to shine and to and to make us more like Christ. Um, the passage I've been given is uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 9 through 12, and so uh, I'm going to read that passage, and then we're going to pray and ask God's uh, blessing on our time together. Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. In fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do more, to do so more and more. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent upon anyone. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you will take your word and make it alive today. Lord, I, I, I don't uh, feel... Um, up to this task, I don't feel like um, I'm ready to do this today in many ways, but that's okay. It's not about me. It's about you and about your truth, and I just pray that your truth will shine and will encourage our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So when Mark gave me this passage, I, I, I kind of... Um, I'm sure I've read this passage uh, a thousand times, but really had never studied this passage. And so it was encouraging for me to kind of see this in a new light and see some fresh thoughts um, from this. And I trust that God will use this in your life. Um, it, um, it seems kind of innocuous. Right. I mean, this is kind of, you know this little passage here. Uh, nothing too too uh, ground uh, earth shattering, right, or groundbreaking. Um, and yet, I think you're going to see today, as we talk about this, that there are some very very practical, particularly poignant passages uh, and truths for us today. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna break this this section into two parts. I know you're supposed to have three. Okay, I'm breaking all the speaking rules. And um, but the first point is the labor of love. And the second one, this is so clever is the love of labor. Okay, I, I've, st I've stolen all of this from someone. Okay, so none of this is original with me. But um, the labor of love and the love of labor. Okay, just two points. I know, yeah, get over it, right? Okay. Um, but the first point will be uh, verses nine and 10. And so we're going to focus on the labor of love first. Now, about your love for one another. The word love here is an interesting word. It's not agape. Does that surprise you? Somebody said, hmm, I like that. I said, I said the same thing when I saw this. It's phileo, brotherly love. Now, initially, I thought, huh, well, I've always thought the other forms of love to be a lesser form of love. And trust me when I say it, there's plenty of scriptures that talk about agape love for one another. But this is talking about brotherly love, Phileo, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Okay. But there's something that's very, very unique that's happening here. Jesus Christ took the word the, the f familial love, the brotherly love that we think of. And in that culture, in the Greco-Roman culture, family was everything. Still in, in this culture today, in, in Hispanic cultures particularly, uh, but, but Spanish, um, uh, Greek, um, the family is everything. You are responsible for your family. And sometimes it's like if a cousin gets in trouble you know you you you've got to you've got to come through so the whole family gets together and they bail out whatever this person's need is that's kind of the insurance policy uh, to uh, it, it, even today in, in in many of these of these cultures so what's happening here is paul and really christ we're going to look at this in a minute is taking brotherly love and applying it on a whole different basis so he's taking brotherly love and saying, 
you as believers are brothers and sisters in the Lord. This is radical to this culture. It was weird. It was weird. The non-believers just looked at this and said, these crazy Christians, what are they doing? Okay. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, my brothers and sisters, to do more and more. Okay. The word, as we talked about, is brotherly love. Jesus redefined this in Matthew 12, verses 47. Someone told him, your, your, brother, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And here's what Jesus said. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. So Jesus here is expanding the concept of brotherly love. Now, Justin Martyr uh, in AD 100 wrote this. We who used to love the acquisition of wealth and possession more than anything else now bring what we have into a common fund and share it with anyone who needs it. We used to hate, and this is isn't this next phrase, isn't this apropos for our culture today and, and you know, a lot of the racial tension that we're, we're dealing with in our country right now. We used to hate and destroy one another and refuse to associate with people of another race or country. But now, because of Christ, we live together with such people and we pray for our enemies. So God is revolutionizing the early church through, through this, this concept. Now, I, there's a lot of question in terms of what this next phrase is intended to communicate. It says, uh, Paul, Paul is saying, I don't even need to write to you about this. Of course he does, <laughs> right? But, but he says, I don't even need to write to you about this because you have been taught by God to love each other. Now, what does that mean? And there's been a lot of question about this, but, but I want to focus on, on the very practical sense in which God himself has taught us, but also demonstrated the love that he intends for us to have for one another. So we see in John 3, 16, the father, okay? Now, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this, we're going to be a little tr Trinitarian here for a few minutes, but the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit, okay? So the father demonstrates love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And you can think of also the passage in Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God, demonst the Father, demonstrates his love in meeting our greatest need. So we have been brought into this family. We talked about this in the er earlier service this morning. We've been brought into sonship because of what God the Father has done. Okay, now Jesus taught us by his actions as well. And this, I'm sure this passage is something that, you know, you will all remember once I start reading it, John 13. And it, it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Boy, there's so much richness there, you know, that Jesus had this conviction, this understanding of, of, of that God was in control of everything. Oh, I, so, I so quickly forget that. So he got up from the meal. In this confidence that he had in his father, he got up from the meal. Now, remember, G Judas Iscariot is here. And, and Jesus knows that Satan has already placed it within Judas's heart 
to betray him. But look at what Jesus does. So he got up from the meal, he took off his outer garment, he wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped, that was wrapped around him. This last week, I was, uh, I've been going through a passage, uh, going through the book of Matthew with a, with a young believer. And um, I, I, just, I love this passage. I think this might be one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. John is nodding his head. Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28. So James and John's father, I'm sorry, mother, comes to Jesus. And she gets down on her knees and, 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 and Jesus says, well, what, what, do you want, what do you want me to do for you? And um, she says, oh, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, see, they were expecting an earthly political, political kingdom. They were expecting Jesus to rise up like the Maccabeans did, you know, a couple of centuries later. Um, they were expecting Jesus to come into his kingdom to conquer Rome. And so James and, and John's mother says, hey, could, could James sit on one side and, 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 and John on the other? And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you ready to drink of the cup that, I, that I'm going to drink? Oh, yes, we can drink of that cup. And Jesus says, oh, well, you will indeed drink of that cup. But whether you sit on my right hand or my left hand is not for mine to give. And then he says this. The Gentile leaders lord it over. Now, we're going to talk about work. In a couple minutes here, that's where I want to really spend the, the, the bulk of my message. So I want to move through this pretty quickly. But the Gentiles lord it over those who are under their authority. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. And this is the passage I love. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. There is a whole concept of spirit, of, of servant, servant leadership, which is based on the life of Christ. And in, in on paper, Many, many, many large corporations say they espouse this servant leadership. Most don't come anywhere close to actually living it out. But, but interesting, just side uh, tidbit there. So the Holy Spirit. I thought this passage was very interesting. It's in Romans 5.5. 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So full Trinitarian here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have taught us, and this is where the word agape comes into. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but the word agape was almost invented to describe the kind of love that God wants us to have. And Thessalonians was one of the first books that were written, First Thessalonians was one of the first books that were written. Actually, it was written before even some of the Gospels probably were written. And so um, the concept of brotherly love was what God used initially. But then as, the, as Scripture goes on, the, the concept of agape love is, is, uh, is fleshed out. Okay, let's just read a couple of uh, uh, historical things. Tertullian in uh, 155 AD to 220 AD said, it is mainly the deeds of love so noble that lead many to put a brand upon us. And this was said almost in uh, ridicule, okay? See how they love each other. It was, it was almost, it wasn't, see, it, was, it wasn't sort of impressed. Well, you know, look at how they love each other. It was like, oh my goodness, look at how they love each other. Those, those, those ridiculous Christians, okay? But when you're looking on the outside at, at the Christians, that's one thing. But when you're on the inside and you're in need and you are loved in this way, as John was saying earlier this morning, it makes an impression. So see how they love one another, they say for them, they, they say, for they themselves are animated by, I'm sorry, for they themselves, that is the unbelievers, were animated by mutual hatred. How they are ready even to die for one another, they say, for they themselves would sooner put to death. This was an apology. Okay, and there were two plagues, and I was just, real quickly, there were two plagues in the first two centuries 
of, of Christianity. Um, and those plagues actually killed somewhere between a quarter to a third of all of the Roman Empire. Um, Marcus Aurelius, Hostilian, uh, 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 Claudius II, and, um, and Gothius were all killed by, by these plagues. It ravaged the empire. Now, a, 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 a sociologist and historian, Rodney Stark, um, did, a, did a study on this. And when he, when he wrote this book called The Triumph of Christianity, How, Christ, How the Christian Movement Became the World's Largest Religion, he wrote this in the 90s. He was not a believer when he wrote this. He since professed the name of Christ. But he wrote, wrote uh, this. During the first plague, the, the famous classical physician Galen fled Rome from, for his country estate where he stayed until the danger subsided. But for those who could not flee, the typical response was to try to avoid any contact with the afflicted. It was understood that the disease was contagious. Hence, when their first symptoms appeared, victims were often thrown into the streets, were dead and dying, and, and dying lay in piles, Stark says. Now, Dionysus, who was, was a believer, said, at the first onset of the disease, they, the pagans, pushed the sufferers away and fled from their, from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treated unburying corpses as dirt, hoping therefore to avert the spread and the contagion of the fatal disease. Yet Christians sought to help the sick, even risk their own lives, as Cyprian, the Bishop of Carthage put it, although this mortality had contributed nothing else, it was especially accomplished Accomplish this for Christians and the servants of God, that we have begun, begun gladly to seek martyrdom while we were learning not to fear death. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending their every need and ministering to them in Christ. With them, they departed this life, this, this life sincerely happy. They were afflicted, I'm sorry, they were affected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepted their pains. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, now um, I, I, I want to I want to um, I, I want to I want to skip down here a little bit. This is the question. This is one of the questions. When we go to the discussion time, this is one of the questions I want to have. I'm not saying that we should necessarily be um, providing uh, nursing people during during the time of the pandemic. You know, there's a lot of hospitals that are designed to do that now. In the first century, there were no hospitals. So the Christians risked their lives to take care of one another. And it just so happened that a lot of the diseases that were, that were, that were the plagues, probably smallpox and measles, didn't really, weren't necessarily life-threatening. If you had somebody who could take care of you to give you food and water, you would probably live through it. Of course, they didn't know that at the time. But this is the question I have for us. I'm not suggesting that we should necessarily nurse one another to help if there's a pandemic, but what does it look like to love each other today if there were a pandemic or in times of, of suffering like this? So that's question number one. Okay, my second point, I wanna move quickly into this. The love of labor. Now verse 11 and 12 say, and make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Now this just, is funny to me. It's almost laugh out loud funny. All right, the, the oxymoron here. Work hard to not work hard. No, that's not exactly what it's saying. But it's saying work hard to live a simple life. Now today, what we say is work hard to take over the world, to become the CEO, to, to fulfill your dreams, to, to establish yourself as important in this world. That's not what Paul says here. Work hard, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Now, I'm retired. So I'm in a different phase of life. And I, so I want to be gentle with those of you who are working. And, and this applies not just to your work, the secular work, but in your work, uh, you know, for the Lord and in any, any ministry as well. But to make it your ambition to not make your work about yourself. Now, last night I went to Wendy's over in, uh, on Jefferson Road. Lovely young lady there. I forgot to bring my wife a meal last night. So, you know, I'm uh, convicted by that, but. 
I picked, I got my own meal and forgot to bring hers. So see how sinful I am. Um, but she was just lovely. And a couple of times I commented and I said, do you, do you like your job? She says, I love my job. She said, when you're working, you need to, you need to take on the brand of the company that you're working for. She got it. I don't know whether she was a believer. I thought afterwards, I wish I had asked her, are you a person of faith? Right. But she got it. Every business that has ever existed was intended to provide service to someone, to make someone's life better. Now, if you're flipping hamburgers at McDonald's, guess what? There's a single mother that's between jobs and needs to go and get a quick meal before she goes to the next job, and you can serve that person. Every job that's ever existed was intended to help someone. A business only succeeds if they're helping someone. But somehow we have this idea that my job is intended to be for me. It's intended to fulfill my needs. That's not what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Now, I'm not saying that you can't better yourself to, to, um, to become, you know, to, to, to move up, if you will, in, in your work. But what I am saying is, is that work is not intended to be selfish. It is intended to be otherly. And that in a very real way, our work is intended to be an expression of love. And that woman last night, I think her name was Kaira, loved me last night. She served me well. And I could feel it from her. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business, work with your hands, just as we have told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent upon anyone. Now, evidently, I'm going to just fly through some of this because my time is up. Um, but, you know, we think of work as, as, as drudgery, the, the statement here. And, and, and in some ways, that, that's, that's true. The work was cursed. But work was not the curse. Adam had work before he had a spouse. And work, we will actually have work in the perfect new earth. You'll be working. Now, Linda, I say that to Linda. She says, I don't want to work. <laughs> I want her life. Okay. But work is intended to, to fulfill, in a sense, of, of, of who we are. When we have a, a, a love. So, um, maybe you're going to make coffee in, in heaven because there will be coffee in heaven. Okay. And, and maybe, you know, but, but I, I know a lady that, that owned a coffee shop over here and she was a believer. And, and I remember just hearing her say, I love my job. It's like, okay, that's what heaven's going to be like. She's going to get up every day and serve coffee to people out of love because work won't be onerous. Our bodies will be strong. We'll develop creative ideas, goals. Together, we'll pursue those goals. You see, you see, God intended for us to be co-creators with him in this place called earth. He created this earth as sort of a, a blank canvas, if you will. And his idea was, you know what? I'm going to create human beings. And together, we're going to co-create and make this something. Well, now things went bad, okay? human sin entered the planet and 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 work has become something it was never intended to be okay so the best we can do now is to love as best we can with the work that we have so make it your ambition to lead a quiet life all right work is meant to be love in action serving the needs of my family my customers my co-workers my employees if you if god does raid you to a position of management it's not for you to have other people serve you. Jesus said, you are to be to serve others. So as the boss, your job is to make your employees jobs as easy as possible and make sure they have what they need to do that. Have you ever worked for somebody who was like that? I have, and it was wonderful. I've also worked for many people for whom that was not their idea. All right, and there's a lot of them. There's more of those. Be one of the former. Be one of those people that pours life into those who work for you. Or if you are the person flipping the hamburgers, serve well with love. Mind your own business. Work with your hands. Um, there's, I just, I'll close with this thought and then I've got the, the second question for you. Um, okay. There's three times 
in, in Thessalonians, where Paul mentions this idea of don't be idle, work with your hands. And here it's very gentle and he presents it in a very positive way. But in chapter five, he says, don't associate with those. And in second Thessalonians chapter three, maybe it's two, he goes further. And he says, discipline those who are idle and who are busybodies. Evidently, we don't know for sure why the reason, but evidently there were people, there was a whole group of people, and evidently enough that he had to mention it three times, who were not working, who were busybodies, who were in everybody else's business, and, and creating problem for the, the leadership. You know, it's nothing worse when you're a boss to have somebody who's a busybody. How many of you are bosses and you've had experienced that, okay? Well, you got somebody that's, that's just creating problems. Paul is saying, work with your hands. Don't do that. Don't be a problem to your boss. Work hard, mind your own business, and work with your hands. Okay, so question, second question. What does it mean to make it your ambition to live a quiet life? So those are the two questions. I'm going to close in prayer. We're going to have a few minutes. Uh, we're going to break up into groups here in a second. Father, we, as we conclude this service, Thank you for your word. Very practical. Lord, just kind of blew me away to see how practical this passage was. Help us to, to win that labor of love and Lord, to love our labor, to love through our labor. And Lord, guide our discussion, we pray, as we break up into groups in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I have the blue group, which is going to be the best group, I'm sure. And so if you have a blue card, if you want to come up to the front here, who has the other colors? Uh, to facilitate this, we're going to have Michaela and Beth. And okay. Uh, All right. Great.